first things first, Declan, how are you? Very well, very well. We have been um, on a quite a mammoth series of tour dates from the UK, supporting the ratings, then in our own headline show, then I was doing some in-stores, and then we've been in Europe for about four weeks-ish, maybe three and a half, but it finishes in, uh, in Saturday, and it's been really good. It's been, it's been an amazing experience. It's been great to come and, and play sold out shows to, to places we've never been before. It's been great to get a foot in the door of places that we've never thought about playing and see kind of whether there's an audience there. And thankfully the answer has been vast majority, yes. Um but yeah, like we we've we've had a really good time. It's been it's felt like something's going up a level. Do you know what I mean? That's that's very good to hear. How's the body feeling? How's the mind feeling after such a such a <laughs> busy yeah, year? Uh, I guess Body is feeling like I'm looking forward to sleeping in my own bed very soon. Um, we've been okay. I think that it's just a lot of it's a lot of a lot of drinking, a lot of eating quite badly, a lot of not really sleeping very much, and then obviously, like if you've ever seen our show, it's quite a physically demanding show. Like I, I, I throw myself about the stage, and and so. Yeah, I think that I've probably I've probably realized that four weeks is about the limit of of when I need a little bit of a break. So I'm glad that one's coming, but it's been it's been really good mentally. It's tough, but it's also great. It's kind of you get thrown from from sure. one to the other. Do you know what I mean? You you come off stage and you get people in parts of the world that you've never been before saying that they've been waiting to see you for four years and that they you know you're you're one of their favorite bands and the gig was amazing and all that, and then you just immediately then driving in a van in a in a bed for like 11 hours <laughs> far from home and not put out of your own routine so it's very high highs low lows i think that's probably how i'd describe to them and you need to try and manage it so that you don't feel either of them and you stay somewhere in the middle the majority of it that sounds smart. When you got into music, did you have any expectations of what it would entail to be in a in a touring band? None whatsoever, mate. None whatsoever. I, I, I really just knew that I wanted to express myself in some way, and, uh, and guitar seemed like a good outlet for that. And it seemed like if I kept going at it, I would get better. So I did that. Then a few important writers that I'd sort of were, were recommended to me by friends kind of changed the way that I thought about lyricism and lyrics and that meant that I tried my hand at really putting effort into the words of songs and then it kind of went well or at least it was received well locally and then from there I kind of had a base of going well I think I'm good at lyrics let's see how good I can get at the other things mm. and I had no expectation whatsoever that I would be <clears throat> Sorry, I'm in the middle of an interview with this. No worries at all. It's okay. Uh, Graham will be able to give you, I think, the info you need. Uh, sorry. Our no worries. Lovely, our lovely driver, Matthias, was asking for the Wi-Fi password um, that Graham has, but I don't. Anyway. <laughs> um, but to answer your question, I don't think I had any expectation whatsoever. I think I thought, let's just let's just play some music and see how it turns out. And it's already exceeded, you know, with... with managed to play all over the world, record an album in LA and go on European tours mm. and your end of year data tells you that people are listening to you. I think your biggest your, your biggest growing um fan base, like the five countries we grew the most in were all in Africa this year, which was cool. Okay. It's a part of that I'm choking to go to and would love to see more of. So yeah, like places like I think Kenya and Egypt and stuff came up on it and I was like I'd, I'd love to go to these places um, so yeah I, I think you kind of just accept that whatever it takes you it's going to take you I, I'm not um, I'm not writing anything off but I have no no demands or expectations I think I just want to keep making music that I like Fair enough now I, th I find it interesting what you mentioned about kind of falling into lyric writing and lyricism and, and... What did you? What kind of literature did you find? What, were it poets? Were it kind of uh, classic literature? But how did you got put onto words and 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 building sentences and and all that? I always I was always a fairly decent communicator, both 
orally and, and written. Like I, I kind of knew that I, I was able to a, put words in ways that were either interesting or funny or convincing or whatever it is, like for whatever I needed to do at school. So I always liked writing. And then I joined the band Young and was the kind of singer and, and lyricist. And I guess probably the first major influence would be somebody like Zach De La Rocha from Rage Against the Machine okay. or Rocca. I think it might be. I'm not sure if it's Rocha or Rocca, but Zach, the singer from Rage Against the Machine, is like one of the best, I think, like really direct, emotional kind of storytellers. And it it's also this thing of like, and I think it was years later that I realised this was what I was doing, but that you, you let the words suit the music and the music suit the words. So, so that there's this, that there's like relationship between the the two ways in music that you can kind of uh, elicit emotion through words and through melody, music, you know, drum beats, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> in terms of writers, I, I guess the first book that I really loved, like really, really, really loved and like thought I love this as much as I love another form of media, like a song or an album or a TV show was Catch on Mirai, which is a very like, you know, very stereotypical answer for a young boy of like sort of 13, 14. But I remember just being like amazed that a book could be funny, like an adult book could be funny. When I was like 12, 13, I was like, oh, this is actually like quite interesting and funny and I, I want to continue to read this. And then people like Kurt Vonnegut, poets like John K. Clark, K. Tempest, um, poets that maybe speak a bit more in a, in a voice that is more immediately understandable as a human being speaking, as opposed to maybe some of the more classical poets who sound kind of ethereal. And that's really cool in its own way, like, you know, but I also think that I like to, especially at the start of your journey, it's really good to see someone speak in a voice that you recognise. Sure. I think Scottish person, a band like The Proclaimers, as much as everyone knows they're kind of one big song abroad, they're an incredible band that have got like a, loads of albums of like fantastic work. And one of the most important parts of them is that it lets you see that the Scottish language is not something to be kind of ashamed of and to cover up and to hide. And I'm sure that's even more true if you get into people who don't speak English in English speaking countries like the, you know, Irish Gaelic population. Um, or if you think about things that are like languages that kind of grow out of someone or a group of people being forced to speak English that wouldn't have naturally, so like Jamaican Patwa and, and stuff like that. I think music's this amazing, this amazing vehicle for language to express itself in less formal ways. So reading, listening to people that proclaim us and then reading people like... Um, God, hold on. I've forgotten. I've forgotten the name of this person and I absolutely have to. Um, no worries. I, I know the feeling. <laughs> uh, uh, so there's a Scottish poet um, and I had to get the name of the poem, but it's the poet's called Tom Leonard and he writes in like phonetic Scots. Mm. So like the one of his most famous poems called The Six O'Clock News it's, this is the six o'clock news. The man said, and the reason to I talk with a BBC accent is, and it's all written in like actual phonetic. Right, 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 right. That would be the wrong way around. But essentially, the lyricism came from first feeling something from other people using lyrics, feeling something from people like Alex Turner from the Arctic Monkeys, Billy Bragg, Javis Cocker, and, and then going, right, well, how is it that? I can try and do this and then realizing that to a, you know, more or less of an extent, a lot of the people, Courtney Barnett would be another person that was massive when I was starting to write music. Um, more or less, these are people who write like they speak and that why don't I try writing like I speak and, and see where it goes. And I wrote better songs than I'd done before. So I just carried on with it. And now if anything, I'm, I'm kind of, almost not going the other direction, but examining that and trying to play around with that and trying to maybe leave more space and be more ambiguous. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think language is just fascinating. I, mean, I, I could I could talk about it for ages. I think as well, like the idea of humanizing through language, people that are dehumanized through language. So even people like Lou Reed and the Pogues sure. would be people that I think are really good at taking the kind of people in society that you're not meant to sympathize with and creating stories that you, you know, you want to sympathize with. And I think that's a really a good exercise in empathy. Um, but that's not unique to to any one writer or, or or genre. I think that's true of so many genres. A lot of a lot of Motown, a lot of R and B, a lot of country music, um, a lot of singer songwriter music is kind of about telling the story of someone who maybe you wouldn't have thought of finding out the story yourself. So yeah, yeah, I just I, I think lyricism in music is is this kind of complete. Yeah, there's infinite possibilities. You know, sure. it's just as valid to write a short story in a song as it is to make up your own language. You know, like Cockatoo Twins, a Glaswegian band that are, are just fucking amazing. And the whole point of it is that it isn't about the words that they're saying. It's about the sound that their voice is making with the music. Sure. Well, that's interesting because you mentioned earlier that uh, you were trying to match or synergize the, the, the words with the music that the band is playing. And now on the second album, then how, how do you see the development from the first album to the second with with that as the music starts to expand? Does, does your lyricism change uh, alongside yeah. with it? It does actually, yeah. Because well, so I wrote the whole of the second album, and uh, on my Mac, in lockdown, and for the first time, unable to like kind of develop the songs with the band. Because usually what would happen is I would come in with like a, a you know chords and a melody, a song, and then we would fill it out. And so for the first time I was like, well, I have to do this myself. And so the vast majority of in terms of hours spent, the, the it's probably like eighty percent of the hours are spent in the music in this versus twenty percent on the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And I think it was because I wanted to try and build up a really definite idea of the kind of emotion. I started teaching as well during this. I started teaching songwriting and it forced me to try and kind of deconstruct elements of it. And what I realized was that a song really exists to do one thing, to make you feel something, to make you feel an emotion. What that emotion is, 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 is it can vary and what that emotion is, is not, doesn't need to be fixed. And, you know, but, but really what a song is, if a song makes you feel an emotion, that has been successful. And so I was like, well, I kind of want to see what I feel just from the music and then try and write in that way. And obviously how you feel just generally and what's going on in your life is going to bleed through. But I tried very hard to respond to the like musical question, if you will, in every song of to, to be like, what is it that this is to me and how can I then enhance this and make this emotion even more pronounced? Mm. or more hidden or more, whatever the whatever the point is your words and your songs your your music having a relationship and so sometimes it's that it leans really in to the to the feeling sometimes it's that it isn't so we've got a song called first to know where mm. that, all the, the the verses are all they sound like this really dead chilled out laid back kind of you know very like if you put different words to it it would sound like a very chilled out happy summer anthem but the sure. words are devastating in that song. The words are the words are about and deliberately so. And I thought it was interesting to try and play around with the fact that you don't really wake up one day and go I'm depressed. It's not like a sudden thing. You start not going out, and then you start not returning people's calls, and then you start eating badly, and then you start not really exercising, and then you start doing. And if all it feels normal, all it just feels like I'm I'm bored, I'm lazy, I'm whatever, I'm tired, I'm not. But but then out of nowhere, you kind of get this feeling of like, oh Christ, I'm I've cut myself off of the world here, and I feel terrible, and I don't really know what to do to get out of it. So that song was kind of meant to be a reflection of that wee journey where you kind of are just plodding along as if everything's great and happy, and I'm just a bit, I'm just taking it easy, nothing's wrong, and then bang, you realise what's going on. Um, and then in other songs, it was. What does that sound like to me? 
I'm going to try and write something that that reflects it as well as I can, leaning into the sound of the music. Mm. And I find it interesting the the uh, juxtaposition. I don't know if that's the right word to use, but the juxtaposition between a, a song like First No, which is more, um, I would say, introspective perhaps, and more more, uh, you know, dealing with depression as you mentioned, and then. A song with one of my favorites, Hundred to One, which is this uh, very narrative style writing. I'm a big Bob Dylan fan, and and I like those kind of storytelling uh, songs as yeah. well. So, so Me how too. does a song, how does a narrative style song like that uh, come together? Is it just from from going out all these years and seeing these people around? I guess so. It's interesting that song. So that song, once again, the, the music came first, and I was like, what is it that that I can do? with a song that I really love the the I love because the melody was also sort of there and I liked how weird it was and it was just mm. like a bit pop and then a bit indie and a bit the streets and a bit something else and then I kind of had another whole different version of it written lyrically very similar melodically but lyrically and, and when we got over or, or I think maybe in the few weeks before I was thinking about going over to record with Luca the producer um I think I changed the chorus to what the chorus is now. The hey, all right, it's time Saturday night. And I was like, right, okay, there's two there's two ways to go from here. You lean into that and you make this just like an anthem about how great nights out are and drinking is. And, you know, that's probably just too easy and too straightforward mm -hmm. for my annoying brain. And so I was like, right, well, what could you do to make that chorus feel kind of like you kind of... Like you've got whiplash, like the car stopped quickly, and what the fuck what's going on here? So you kind of have this idea of it starting like a, and it's also got a wee bit of like a lullaby feel to sure. it. And it starts off very gentle. Then then it's kind of funny. And then the first chorus, I I, I think what's really interesting in music, and you can do this with words, you can do it with melodies, you can do it with rhythm, is that you can do the exact same thing, and if you change everything around it, it feels completely different. And so when you take a chorus is kind of very unambiguous or, or at least very straightforward as hey all right it's time saturday night da, 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 da. first verse sets it up to kind of be a bit funny hey saturday night and then every verse after that kind of it feels very strange and or at least mm -hmm. the, the at least the attempt is for it to feel almost like ironic or almost like that there's like the audience knows something that the character doesn't. So like the audience is aware that, you know, to drink and dance and do all the other things that you're meant to do is this kind of increasingly problematic solution to this character's sure. problem. Um, but I, then the story just kind of came from writing. I try and auto write, I try and just sit down and write and then edit. Because I think you can kind of, when you're on a roll, you can get something. Um, that feels a bit more urgent and maybe a bit more honest if you kind of just get it all out in one for me anyway. Um, so I, I was pleased with how that came together lyrically, very pleased. And I think it, my, my one worry for it was it would turn into like an anti-drinking PSA. Mm. <laughs> and well, was, I'm, glad, I'm glad that I don't think it came across as that because it was like, it was meant to be this kind of social commentary on what are we doing really? Why 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 is it that from Scotland in Scotland anyway, why is it that so many, particularly men between the ages of about 16 and about 60, not only choose to just forget their weekends, but are like so unbelievably excited by it that nothing else matters and enjoy it and enjoy it in this kind of manic way, this kind of way that's like kind of chaotic if you're not if you're on board. It feels really normal. You take a step out, you don't drink for the night, you stop drinking, you go home early. You realise that there is a kind of let's drive the Titanic full force at the iceberg. Sure, sure. Kind of feeling to drinking in Scotland anyway, and it may be true all over the world, but I can't really comment on how true or not it is. Travel in Europe, it does seem like people have a moderately more sensible approach to drinking on the continent than, than we do in Britain, but um, I'm sure it's true all over the shop that there is this kind of, I'm going to drink as much as my body will take and almost I'm excited to ignore the consequences of that.
Mm. So I just wanted to talk about that. That was pretty much it. No, but it's interesting that you mentioned that because when I listened to the song and went through the lyrics, what it reminded me of, there was this book I read by a Scottish guy, I think. Um, what's his name? Then? Darren McGarvey, Poverty Safari, which was kind of about yeah, glass, I uh, glass uh, and poverty. In I, know, glass. I, know, I know that. I know that. I know that. I know, I've, I've read the book. It's, it's a fantastic book. He's a, he's a, and I found that very interesting. But it, it, it goes into what you are saying, kind of this, this, this almost culture of of poverty, or this, this, this culture of of destructive behavior. In 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 a way, it's 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 very interesting. And then that that's what what it kind of reminded me of. Absolutely, I think like anyone in Scotland will be able to tell you. A, a version of that story mm. um, and I think it's because it's probably for a thousand different reasons right and there's no one reason that I can give you but I definitely think part of it is that when you go to these kind of post-industrial communities in Scotland places that used to have like a purpose the whole like up to the point where there's genuinely places like Ravenscraig and, and, and various different places in Scotland where it's communities built around like a mine or around a factory sure. around a thing and you have people whose lives had a twofold purpose that isn't necessarily there anymore, which is religion and work. People used to go to church on a Sunday and believe that if they were a good person, God would reward them. People used to know that if they went into work on a Monday and they worked hard, they'd be able to pay their bills, they'd be able to get their kids' clothes, they'd be able to afford their house. And as much as that is not a perfect system, I'm not saying that the 60s and 70s in Scotland or the 50s and 60s in Scotland is a perfect system by any stretch of the imagination. But there are certain elements of stability and of sure. reliability that have been removed completely. And I think that... Do you ever, do you ever stay out? Do you ever plan to go home at 10, having work, and work the next day, and you end up out at 12, so you stay out till 3? Because you're like, ah, well, I've I've already done the damage. I may as well. <laughs> I might as well, it. yeah. Get get every minute out of it that, that I possibly can. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to feel bad tomorrow anyway. Why not feel bad and kind of make my own way? I think there's like a tiny element of that that's kind of analogous to the idea of, well, Monday to Friday isn't really mine. Sunday, I kind of need to be in. So there's going to be this Saturday, this mm. space in the night where I can truly do what I like and for some people that's sitting in and watching the telly for some people that's going to the pub and getting blistered and for some people it's whatever but um yeah no, I think no, part... I yeah, yeah. So, so no, no I was gonna say I, I don't drink I barely drink anymore for the past 10 years 10 years after uh since I've been out of college but you mentioned watching tv there's there's there are these evenings where I'm watching tv and I'm thinking to myself well I should go to bed right now and then for, for some reason, two hours later, you're still watching random stuff and you think, okay, so tomorrow's wasted now. And all of this, it's, it's weird how that, how, how your mind... And even the idea of like anything that you enjoy that doesn't make money for someone else is time wasted. Do you mm. know what I mean? Like if you enjoy your work, your work can be productive or make money for you even. But so you're just sitting and watching telly, like there's few greater pleasures in life, man. Like I, I really am sure. I'm such like an advocate for zoning out and just enjoying yourself and I do think that that is very much what things like if I'm sitting and watching The Simpsons or if I'm sitting and watching Arrested Development or, or watching some four and a half hour YouTube video essay on some really niche pointless topic there is an element of like I now try and frame the fact that I know this isn't necessarily productive as like a good thing so yeah, I've been productive. I've done my productive shit. This is this is me deliberately not being productive. So yeah, it's kind of just about agency, isn't it? It's about taking control of your own life. And and alcohol and, and drugs in general can make you feel like you've got even the ones that don't do it. I, I mean, I'm I'm an ex-smoker. Mm. Just about for a year and a half, give or take the odd puff of a cigarette that then I immediately put down and go, This is this tastes like crap now. Um but I remember the feeling of, of being stressed and of just smoking a cigarette and just taking five minutes to go, I, the world's on fire, but what I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm doing, I'm taking this, I'm smoking this, and then after this, I'll deal with it. There is like an element of these substances and the effect, the, the, just, the, the decision to use them almost as being this kind of like reclaiming of agency. But maybe that's just, just fucking a philosophy degree misapplied. 
Tea. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, I, 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 do, I do think there's some truth to it because when there's very little agency uh, that you have in the world, then those little things become vastly more important. But this ties <laughs> into to my final question, then, uh, quite quite well, I think, because in the song "Come Outside," you talk about some of these things. I will, uh, I, I think, and and one of the questions I usually ask people is what their definition of success is and we're talking about time wasted wasted time and you mentioned the definition of success in the song so how do you see success and especially in what the band is doing now as you mentioned in the beginning of this interview it, the band is going on an upward trajectory so how do you kind of see success now so the, the, there's my answer philosophically and my answer professionally my answer philosophically is happiness mm -hmm. uh, and that is barely an answer that's just another question <laughs> I, I totally understand that for me that would be you you feeling like you are trying in some way to improve the world and in, in whatever way you are best equipped to do so and that you have people around you who love you and that you love them right that that would mm. be my probably my definition of happiness ish you feel like you're making a bit of a difference and I get in a positive way, and the people around you love you, and you love them professionally. Uh, quitting, quitting, uh, quitting other jobs. That that that's everyone. If you ask any band, and I'm sure you have, I'm sure this is the most common answer given. Um, there is a relentless ambition that is helpful to have to say, uh, I want to play in the moon. I want to, I want to do twenty five nights in Madison Square Garden. I want to do this. I want to do that. Right. That that is probably not a bad thing if you don't suffer the the kind of mirror image of, of comparing yourself to people who are more successful and it killing you i mm. think if you can be if you can just be that ambitious be that ambitious aim for whatever it is that you do my own personal success either financially or in terms of like the size of the band hasn't ever really been as big a concern for me as opposed to do i love what we are doing mm. i want to continue to make i basically want to make as much music as it's possible to make so that so that when whatever happens at the end of my life, I can go. Do you know what? You, there's no there's nothing there's no avenue you didn't get to go. You 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 wanted to make this, so you made it. You wanted to make that, so you made it. I want to write a book. I want to try and make some TV. I want to try and act and stuff. I want to do. I want to try everything possible. So professionally, whatever would allow me to do that would be success in my eyes. And I think probably the easiest way for you to be allowed to do that is that all of your income comes from one primary job that doesn't... Whereas right now, I am spread so thin over so many different things. Um, so success professionally to us, I think, would mean being able to tour with enough regularity and the venue's been in enough size that we go on one tour a year and it pays everybody's wages. Mm. That'd be fucking great. We all like touring. We all like touring the places that, like, we are now adding cities. Like, the, we've toured the UK enough that we now have a broad enough sample size to go, right, here is where we're going to go for the next year or two years. This is where we can grow. Then when they grow, we'll maybe go back to the other places that aren't really showing us as much potential. This tour in Europe has been brilliant because we've added, like, six or seven cities onto that list of being like, well, here is the priority areas. Like we sold, I think the first gig to sell out was Prague, sold Budapest out, sold Vienna out, Paris, four dates in Germany, I think, at least two of which are sellouts, the other two very close, Copenhagen. We've added cities there, so so there's a path there. Um, but I guess there's an element of this as well that there's always, I think that, you want to make art that has an impact on people mm. and you want to feel that, that it's more than just a throwaway listen. I heard you tune in TikTok and so I, I decided to come because I know the chorus. Like I would I would much rather have a smaller audience that really cared than than a bigger audience that 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 kind of sort of knew you that would go away for a bit because we hope that we've given people who like us enough of an indication from album one to album two that like we're going to try stuff. We're going to try and see where it leads us. We wouldn't want to be pigeonholed into we're going to do no fun. 
again and again and again and again. As much I love that tune, I just don't want to make the same thing twice. Sure. And we've, we've already done that. We've done it, I think we've done the first album thing pretty well and I'm pretty happy with it and there's not a lot I'd go back and change. So as we keep playing live, what's interesting is that the, the playing live makes you want to write faster songs. I think the reason that the album is slower is because the environment it was created in meant that you wanted to sit with music and listen and, and on second listen and third listen kind of go, oh, oh, I've discovered new things about this. So I ended up going back to people like, I think, Frank Ocean, um, Kendrick Lamar, Fontaine's DC, a lot mm. of bands that, while absolutely they have their kind of rowdier, louder stuff, are people who you can listen to again and again and again and again and again and, again and find new stuff. Whereas now we're out playing live, we've already written a song kind of on the road and we've played it live a couple of times and it's like very quick and very like immediately people are responding and, and you go, oh, that's the feeling that you actually really want to chase in a live room. You want to have people be energised. So I think the next thing will be faster. What version of fast that is, I don't know, but I think it will be faster. We're going to uh, wait and see how it turns out. And then yeah, uh, yeah. I believe tomorrow in Amsterdam is also sold out, which is, um, I'm glad that uh, us uh, Dutch people also have embraced the band. Uh, yeah, as well. yeah. You, you've been making um, mixed decisions lately, so I'm glad that you deserve <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was, unfortunately, I, I was going to do this interview in person, but I can't be there this weekend. So uh, oh, I'm very sorry about that. But uh, thank right. you so that's much right. for taking the time uh, to sit down and talk with me. No so. worries at all, mate. Pleasure chatting to you. Take care of yourself. Have a good weekend. You too, man. Have a good one.